Hi everyone, it's noon, so it's time for what's new this week at One Schoolhouse. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development, and we have a full house today for a webinar, I think, you know, for folks, it gives us a nice screen here. And we're really looking forward to this conversation. So with me today, I have Peter Gao from One Schoolhouse, and then Chris Himmler and Adam Hellebuck. And before we get started, I'm just going to lay some groundwork for how we might go, and then we are going to dive right in. So I'm going to share my screen. And if you would like to use the closed captioning, please turn that on. We do enable closed captioning here. Give me one second. Oops, all right. You're going to get a sneak preview of where we're, where we're headed. But so for today's webinar, we've got Why Place-Based Learning Matters. And we're going to talk to two individuals who are really living the independent curriculum ideal in developing place-based curriculum. So on our blog, we have a post written by Peter, and it is, um, you can tell a little bit about what we're thinking about place-based learning right now, just from the title. So I would really encourage you to check out Peter's blog post. Next week, we're going to be talking about creating intentional faculty culture, something that Schools leaders have struggled with a little bit in the past year, but we are ready for next year. Um, we're going to be talking a lot today about advanced independent curriculum. If you haven't downloaded the free standards for advanced independent curriculum, please jump on independentcurriculum.org and grab a copy. Now, every week we do a poll and we ask academic leaders in our email what, what they're thinking about. This week's question was, how does your school engage in the local community? And this is a little bit of a lead in to what we're gonna talk about here. Lots of time still to answer the poll. Sienna will put a link in the chat so you can add your voice, but not surprised maybe about what number one is. Chris and Adam, you kind of nodded and chuckled when we were looking at this before. Um, some other interesting things, and we're going to maybe push you to think a little bit differently about what you may or may not um, include in the poll. So I'm going to stop sharing, and without further ado, we are going to get going. So Adam and Chris, you are here because you have developed a really unique place-based U.S. history course that really departs, departs from the traditional and uh, looks at you know, a, a really completely different way of being place-based during that. So could you both just introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your work? And then Peter, I'm gonna ask you a question too, just to give you a heads up about how you got connected and how you were so excited to share this work with me. Sure, uh, my name is Adam Hellebuck. Uh, I have taught at University Liggett School for the past 14 years uh, in the social studies department. Uh, I also currently serve as the Dean of Curriculum and Assessment uh, pre-K through 12th grade. My name is uh, Chris Hemmler. I am the Cynthia N. Ford Chair for History and the Social Studies uh, at University Liggett School. I've been here for uh, six years. Uh, and in addition to the place-based US history course, I teach uh, a course in the history of the 60s. Uh, and a Native American studies course. Great, thank you. And Peter, how did you come across Adam and Chris and their work? Well, some years ago, I was poking around, trying to learn all, all I could about very many schools. And one of the schools that someone pointed me to was University Liggett School and said, they're doing some amazing things at University Liggett School. Um, they have uh, developed a completely independent advanced curriculum and curriculum as a whole. They have amazing project things going on. And they're doing a place-based U.S. history program. And I've realized, Sarah, in the last few days, really, that place-based learning has been a part of my life since I was in high school, if not earlier. Um, as something that really, really matters to me. And I heard this idea and I lit up and I got in touch with these guys. The next thing I knew, there was a really good webinar. I hope the link will go up in the, uh, to the Vimeo recording of that uh, in the chat. And uh, then later did a, a webinar on a, a project program that University Liggett has. 
I just thought this was the greatest idea since sliced bread, and why isn't everybody teaching U.S. history that way? Well, at least in the U.S. Um, but that's how I got to know these guys, and I have been so excited by the work that they have continued to do. Um, they'll talk about how they have grown the program um, into a, a community of educators interested into uh, in developing the place-based learning approach and expanding it. Great, thank you. And I just wanna remind everybody, we'll use the chat for sharing links and resources. And we definitely wanna answer questions. So use the Q&A to ask questions. So before we get too far, we've got history people here, right? So we want some context. So can you tell us a little bit about what's the course, how long it's been offered and what's its place in your department? Who takes the class? I know that was a lot of questions all at once. Sorry about that. <laughs> So I can start with the uh, kind of creation of the class. And Chris, if you want to talk about where it, where it lives uh, today. Um, so the class came about uh, now about eight years ago, um, right as our school was um, dropping the advanced placement program. And our head of school at the time, Joe Healy, uh, had talked about um, when he had moved to Detroit, uh, the just the, he didn't know all the rich history, history and culture of the area and found it just fascinating to look into. And as we were transitioning away from AP US history, he made this comment of, well, why don't we do, you know, US history through Detroit's lens? And then, you know, we, we finished our conversation and went on. And um, a colleague and I took that as, a, as an uh, imperative. And so over the next year or so, we designed um, what became the pilot program of the course, where uh, we took our, all of our American history themes and said, what is the local connection to each of those? How can we connect this to a specific place in our community, take students there, make them, and field trips being the, the top, uh, you know, most used uh, mm -hmm. thing, but instead of field trips, like how can we really kind of explore those sites? How can we be active participants and not just kind of uh, recipients of information there? How can we do research at these places? And uh, came up with uh, eight to 10 units that we uh, worked through through the first year and uh, haven't, haven't stopped moving since. Great. And Chris, where were you when this was happening? <laughs> so I, uh, uh, before I came to University of Liggett School, I was uh, the manager of education and learning programs at the Henry Ford, which some people know as Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation in Greenfield Village, or maybe the Ford Roots Factory Tour. It's all part of one kind of complex uh, in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, I met Adam uh, the summer he was planning the class. Uh, he came to a, a professional development workshop that we were offering. Uh, on America's Industrial Revolution. And he was very, very interested in a lot of local resources, the resources that we had from the Detroit area. And so Adam and I got to talking. He told me about their plan for a place-based US history course. I was absolutely hooked uh, uh, from day one. Um, I loved the idea. Uh, and so Adam piloted the class for the first year. I was still at the museum, but then uh, someone retired at Liggett and uh, I caught wind of this retirement and uh, I knew uh, that uh, if I was going to go back into the classroom, I had been a, a classroom teacher uh, uh, prior to that, um, that this was the place and this was the curriculum that was, that was going to bring me back into the classroom. And so uh, I took the leap uh, and came to Liggett and uh, have, uh, uh, haven't looked back. I love that. When we were planning this <clears throat> webinar, one of the things that you uh, said to me is that U.S. history isn't getting shorter. So you had to connect it better to your mission and place space really helped you do that. And you said that you identified 13 different skills and decided that a project and place-based approach would help you um, work with students so that they could demonstrate mastery of those skills. Can you talk a little bit about that approach? The, the th it wasn't 13 skills uh, in the beginning. Oh, um, so when we sat down as a department a few years ago, uh, to come up with a skills list uh, for uh, not just the 10th grade uh, place-based history class, which all sophomores take, but also our ninth grade world history class. And then uh, once they take those core classes, they go on to uh, electives in history that they get to choose from. Uh, and so when we, uh, we sat down, our first list was 57 skills, um, which uh, was very hard for the students. Of course. Seven, yeah. <laughs> you had a Heinz very approach. hard for okay. the students to keep track of. And so over the years, we have kind of uh, uh, tweaked those skills uh, and, and helped allocate them to the, to the 
to the courses and the goals that um, uh, that that they that they most uh, directly fit. Uh, but yeah, now we have settled on for the U.S. the place-based U.S. history class. We've settled on um, 13 skills that the students really uh, experience the year through. Um, and so for us, um, uh, it's it, you know the, the place-based content is obviously important. But what we really want the students to walk away with are these are these skills that they can then apply to other classes uh, or professional life uh, or personal life uh, in general. Um, uh, Adam, you want to talk a little bit more about the uh, about how we kind of marry content and skills at, at Liggett? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for us, really, to kind of use a, a Model T analogy, it's really relevant to our, our local uh, Detroit curriculum. Um, the skills are really the engine of the vehicle of learning for our students, and the content is the road. Um, and at our school and in our program, the students really get a, a lot of ownership over what content uh, they want to explore. And so those roads can take many different paths. Um, and so we have skill, uh, um, skill standards and, 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 and lists, but, but the content is much more fluid. So we're really kind of focusing on the big themes um, of American history. So when we look at um, the revolutionary time period, uh, for us, it's really the War of 1812, the second war for independence rather than the first, but we can still teach those big ideas uh, of American history through whatever lens the students are, are looking at. And our project uh, work uh, that culminates every unit uh, really kind of connects the dots for them and it allows them to dig deeply using what we do in class to, to prime them and, and as practice for their skills. Uh, but really uh, the students are driving the curriculum, uh, the, the content version of that. So were you already, as you began to develop this, taking an outcomes-based approach to curriculum development or did you also bring that into play at the same time? I think, I, I think the idea and the, the shift had happened uh, it, to outcomes. Uh, I think though, the class really showed why that was so necessary. So any sort of uh, reservations or, or things among, uh, um, among our faculty uh, really melted away uh, once this class took off. Uh, really kind of, it, it, essentially in, in this place-based class, you have to be outcomes-based. You have to be objective-based. Uh, because it can be, get, get really easy uh, to kind of get lost. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for our students really to, to center them around like, here, here are our objectives, here is our essential question for the unit, here's what we're going to focus on. You can take that any direction you want, but at the end, we're all gonna come back together and we're gonna be able to talk about this question no matter what you looked at, whether that's the institution of slavery in the city of Detroit, whether that's um, transportation infrastructure, all those things can come together and we can have really deep, serious conversations around them. And I, I wanna come back to something that you just said, but I wanna pull Peter in because he's been talking about relevance and what you just described is students making this relevant for themselves. And Peter, in your work with schools, can you just talk a little bit about what changes when students can see the relevance just laid before them and being really explicit? Yep, you're muted. All that we know about learning tells us that students learn better. We all learn more effectively when we actually care about what we're learning, what we're, when what we're learning has some meaning to us in some specific way. Um, I don't know what's more important to anybody at any given time, uh, whether it's a child or an adolescent or a, a septuagenarian, than where they are in the moment. And so looking at what's going on and what has gone on in the world, and this can be, I think, in any discipline, uh, through the lens of where one is, uh, where one, you know, the history, the, the natural, uh, natural history, the literature and art that's been created, the kinds of cultures and languages that are, are used, all of this is stuff that makes kids care. And uh, it won't come as a surprise to anyone that again, when, when students care about what they're learning, when it makes sense to them, when it connects viscerally and sometimes immediately to their lives and what's going on in their world, the learning is, is way more powerful. 
So Hannah and Chris, going back to what you were saying before about when you dive into what's happened in this place where we are, you mentioned to me that students are sometimes surprised by what they don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think one, one of the things that that just a little bit of background about our school is that, you know, we're located in, in Gross Point Woods, which is a, a suburb of Detroit. Um, and so we pull students from Detroit, um, but a lot of our students come from the suburbs, from the Gross Points and the surrounding areas. And so for them, um, Detroit is a place where you go to watch a, you know, a live sports game or go to a concert, um, but there's not a whole lot else outside of that. And so what we really see uh, in, our, in our course when the students are done is they feel, they feel a deeper connection to, to their place, to the city of Detroit, to the Gross Points, to the Great Lakes region as a whole. And so, um, uh, you know, one of the ways in which this manifests is that um, we've noticed a huge uptick in student-driven service projects um, uh, that are directly involved uh, in the city of Detroit. And so just this past year in a pandemic, we had three different major student service initiatives um, that were planned by students independently of anyone else um, and, uh, and, and really wanted to give back because, and these are, these are all students who are either in the process of taking the place-based history course or had just completed it last year. Um, and so there's this, there's this stronger connection, the stronger bond that they feel with their sense of place once they've finished with the class. And that's something that I certainly wasn't anticipating um, uh, coming into this. And, and you know, that's been one of the things that, that, makes, me, that makes me happiest uh, at, at the end is to see how, how much more students connect with themselves and with, with the area around them. To connect to that mm -hmm. idea um, for people that are interested in, in doing place-based learning in their own institutions, um, you know, even places for us like the Detroit Institute of Arts, which we said when we were planning this, everyone's been there. Our students have been there, maybe not, maybe, let's, let's think of other places. Well, we surveyed, we collected lots of data um, when doing this, this pilot program and found that most of our students hadn't been there. We made this assumption and it wasn't accurate. Or if they had been there, they didn't remember it. And so they were able to see these places, you know, with a brand new eye and with with new questions and new uh, new lenses. And so it was really worth our while uh, to explore some of these places that we kind of had initially written off uh, as well. It's it's old to them. They've they've experienced it. Yeah. And when we talked about this, you used the term um, cognitive dissonance that kids had a mythology in their mind about what what the place was like and that you had to set up some cognitive dissonance in them so that they could then learn what their place really was, right? What is it actually like there? And want to find out about transfer. So if you've been coming to these webinars, you know that transfer is one of my things that I talk about a lot. Do you see this transfer then in your alums? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, just the idea, like you said, that the deconstruction of a national mythology uh, and looking and bringing to the forefront stories that have not been told or have been uh, suppressed uh, in, in our history. Just having students look at these and that dissonance happens, right? They, they start to question these, these things that they had taken for granted. And we definitely see that um, outside of our class. As Peter mentioned, uh, we have an academic research program uh, for our juniors and seniors where they do um, capstone research into a topic of their, their choice for a sustained period. Um, and the questions that they're able to ask, the research that they do, um, they're really challenging assumptions in a lot of ways. And, and it's great for us to see. Uh, we, like to, we like to think a little bit of that came from, from our class. That's great. And you know, you mentioned other people who are interested. Um, do you get some folks who say, well, sure, you can do this. You're in Detroit. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a place, you know, that's a part of a deeply embedded part of American history. Do you get that question? And think of what you just said, right? You can do this. You're in Detroit. What a rich area to do this, right? Well, how is that totally contrary to the national narrative of Detroit? Right, the media narrative, and so this right. is you taught story. me that when we were preparing. So now right. I am you know, convinced I <laughs> Detroit is the best place in the world to do this. <laughs> right, I mean it, it, it is, and and it's just it shows that you, you have to do this where you are. You you can do it anywhere, right? Um, you need to do it where you are, uh, and dig and dig down. What are those local stories? Like all history is local. You know, we've we we've talked about this, um, but really making those connections to to your place, like, yeah, you might be outside of a big city. That's great. What, what does your community have? 
focus on that one thing that you think you know really well and challenge every assumption you have about it. Approach it from a new lens and explore it with the students and you'd be very surprised what uh, what you can come up with. And it might be a really engaging lesson. It might turn into a unit. It might be the basis of your whole uh, US history class. And I, I think one of the misconceptions about our about the place-based course for, for people who aren't familiar is that it's that it's a Detroit history course, which is, you know, that's only part of it, right? And so um, in order for our students to be able to draw those connections between how Detroit is similar or different than the rest of the nation, um, they have to learn what's going on in the United States at the time. And so, you know, we have an overarching question for the course is, is, is the story of Detroit the story of the United States? And so each unit, the students can kind of take that base question and apply that to different concepts throughout U.S. history. And so without knowing what's going on in the nation, um, you can't draw those connections, you can't draw those comparisons. And so, um, you know, I have a, a, a a teacher that I used to work with uh, at the museum who uh, teaches in, in rural Iowa and was talking about, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing place-based history, then I'm, then I'm completely breezing over the civil rights movement. And that's not true, right? So if, first of all, the civil rights movement is widespread and was, was happening everywhere. Um, but um, even if there aren't great examples of civil rights activists in your rural Iowa area, you're learning about the civil rights movement in, in US history, and you're trying to draw those connections. Why wasn't there this push? Um, why, why is the United States kind of doing this, but, but our local area is not? And so by drawing those connections, um, uh, not only do, do we feel like you, can, you could do it everywhere, but we feel like you're learning US history more so than you would if you're just learning, if you're just learning those stories. And if I could just go back briefly to, to the mythology, every place has, has mythology about it. You know. Um, in the local Detroit area, we like to, we, we think of ourselves as the last stop on the Underground Railroad before they reached Canada, uh, before uh, Friedman uh, um, reached, reached uh, um, you know, the, um, shed, shed the shackles of bondage as they crossed the Detroit River, which is part of the story. But what a lot of people don't recognize, even people who have lived there their whole lives, is that, is that we, D Detroiters, enslaved people as well, both Native Americans and, and, and you know, African slaves. And so, those are stories that we don't generally tell in the Detroit area. We tell the happy stories, we tell the good times. And so um, every place has those myths. Every place has those, has those stories that, that kind of support and, and prop up our history. And we should certainly celebrate those for sure, but we can't do that at the, at the expense of ignoring uh, maybe some of the messier and uglier sides of our history. And, and that doesn't change whether you're in Detroit or somewhere else, every place has, has those. And so um, we, we, we feel that, that this um, can and should be done anywhere and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right, and you had a book to recommend. We were talking about places that develop, I think the phrase that you used was a frozen story. Like mm -hmm. here is the story of this place. And there are some really vibrant examples where places are rethinking, like what do we really know about this place? Um, and the title, I'm going to forget it. Will you tell me the title of the book again, and we'll put it in the chat. Um, so this book is is primarily designed for historic house museum uh, leadership to read, but I think for educators, it's really valuable too. Uh, it's called The Anarchist's Guide to Historic House Museums. Uh, and it really talks about how, and, and for most places, right, and for us as well, historic house museums are kind of a, a, a convenient way to, to step into history. And really kind of looking at, at how those historic house museums have approached history, have approached the narrative, how have they evolved with the community is a great entry point for schools, right? These are places that are really, uh, they crave community involvement. They, they, they want to work with people. They want to give tours and share their information, but they also want to work with people. And so this is a, another for our friends that want to um, try some place-based education can be a, a good entry point too, is, is to connect with your local historic house museum and see um, you know, what are they working on? What do they need help with? And uh, see how your students can do that. So, and I want you to share some of that because you've got some great examples of how students have become engaged. And I just wanna tell everybody, please use the Q&A for questions. We're definitely gonna leave some time for Q&A. Yeah, I mean, I, so even though we are in Detroit and we have a lot of large organizations, we feel like our most fruitful partnerships come from these smaller local um, uh, community organizations. And so, um, for example, we work, we've worked with local, a local historical uh, commission 
uh, and students have proposed signage for a now defunct canal uh, that is currently up in, in a local history museum and we're trying to secure funding um, to, to get a more permanent um, uh, installation for our student signage to go in and kind of tell the story of, of this canal. Um, Adam, do you want to talk a little bit about our partnership with the Gross Point Historical Society? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Gross Point Historical Society um, in the COVID pandemic could not give tours. And so they were looking at digital content much more deeply and uh, realized that their content uh, was a bit out of date. And so they, uh, we offered to work with them and craft articles for their website on local history. We made it, we incorporated it into our class as a part of a project. Uh, so we had students researching uh, the Underground Railroad in Gross Point. We had students on the cholera epidemic of 1832, which Chris and I did not know really anything about. And so it was fascinating to, to see. Um, the the rush Bago Treaty, that disarms the Great Lakes. We have a, a multiple page article that's so fascinating and so connecting to local people's interests. Like when you're boating on the lake, why don't you see warships? Like it, it's really, all these topics are fascinating. And so the Gross Point Historical Society worked with our students to provide that authentic learning experience. They suggested edits, they suggested things that, that would better serve uh, the community. The students made those edits, worked with them. And that work is uh, currently in the process of being published uh, on their website uh, for, for the public. Um, and That's once you get so involved in these kind of historical um, societies, um, Chris and I both just joined the board of the Gross Point Historical Society uh, to, to kind of cement these things. So you, you kind of, you quickly get ingrained in, in more local community um, uh, partnerships, which is just even better. Right, and that relationship has got to be positive for everybody involved. And then I wanna go back to what you said about the why don't you see warships on the lake? And then you tie that back to your thematic approach rather than it being a, a narrative of this happened and this happened, it's a here's the bigger theme and here's a place where it comes to life. And, how do students respond? It's not easy at first. Um, you know, students uh, students aren't necessarily expecting or used to that type of approach. Uh, so there's some growing pains in, in the first few weeks of school. But but realistically, I mean, the students by the end of the year, the students have have extreme buy-in. And this year was the, our toughest year. Obviously, um, we we were able to finally take one one site exploration uh, in in late May. Um, and so we were trying to teach a place-based history class without going to a place, and, and we were able to we were able to do it. Um, uh, but to see them in that last kind of last few weeks of school, they they you know they went to they went to a, a, a history museum and and really allowed the material culture to to kind of drive their understanding. Um, and so by the end of the year, not only is there buy-in, but there is excitement about the places where we go and the stories. Uh, that we learn about. Um, and so it's it's not easy in the beginning, but but they get there. So th that that's your job, right? <laughs> so to help them get there. And so we have a question that's come in, which is how is this course positioned within the rest of the high school uh, history or social studies curriculum? Uh, so um, when, when students enter uh, the upper school at Liggett, they, uh, they have world history uh, in, in ninth grade. Um, and then they, uh, they transition to US history um, in, in our 10th grade class. And, um, and then for 11th and 12th graders, we have a list of about 20 electives, um, uh, 10, per, 10 per semester uh, that, they can, that they can choose to take. And those topics range uh, from 19th century Europe to uh, a material culture class to Native American studies to uh, um, you know a, a new course that we're offering on race and inequality, uh, and so really students can choose in, as juniors and seniors students can choose courses that they are that they are interested in. But all of our courses use the same structure for our skills development. So we have uh, four main skills categories. So each class would have different skills within within those categories that students work on. And so um, we've, we've been very intentional over the last few years about, about having um, vertical integration in school. And then within the 10th grade curriculum, um, we are getting more and more um, cross-departmental, cross-disciplinary um, uh, collaboration, especially with our site visits, where um, on some of our site visits, students are taking, you know, water quality samples for their chemistry class uh, or 
Um, they're calculating uh, the speed of water before and after a historic dam for their math class. And so um, we're starting to get more and more uh, uh, cross-disciplinary buy-in, um, which really helps kind of cement um, uh, those, those concepts and those skills uh, as they transfer them between subjects. And the class also connects into our uh, academic research program as well. Um, so the academic research program, while the capstone project is for 11th and 12th graders, uh, we have a four-year academic research program. Uh, ninth grade is, is core skills, um, uh, thinking routines, um, inquiry, the basis of inquiry. 10th grade, uh, the course is our US history class. So every 10th grader takes our place-based US history class. And it's also called ARP 10. Uh, and so for us, it, it uh, is a way for us to practice the research skills, to further the questioning that they've started um, and get them ready uh, for their capstone projects in 11th and 12th grade. That's great. Um, we also had the question of where can I learn more? And so Sienna is putting several reading resources in and I know it's sold out for the summer, but if y'all wanna talk a little bit about the work that you do in the summer with teachers who are interested in learning more, that would be great. Yeah, um, we, we would love to hear from you. Like we love talking about place-based work. We love um, consulting and, and, and really working together, collaborating to build some programs because we learn just as much uh, from talking to people as probably more than we share. Uh, so, so we love it. Um, but we're doing a, a workshop, a summer workshop, hopefully annual. Um, this first one is brought to you uh, by a great uh, grant from the E.E. Ford uh, Foundation um, where we're doing a two week teacher workshop uh, to teach kind of the, the how-tos of place-based education, and especially place-based humanities education. Um, and so the first week, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at um, kind of the, the connections, the, the theory, the how do you partner with a historic house museum? How would you partner with a local um, historical museum or um, a, a historic site or religious organizations, right, or local nonprofits? Um, so the first week will be kind of uh, how-tos with our partners, uh, and, and they'll be sharing like what are the best in inroads mm -hmm. in general to, uh, to work with them. The second week is going to be a case study of Detroit uh, in US history. And so we'll take uh, participants through um, basically learning how Detroit can showcase American history that they can hopefully take back to their, uh, their communities. It is almost totally site-based. Uh, so we have a very long transportation list of places where we're going to go. Um, local restaurants, sites, um, really all around uh, the Great Lakes region, uh, even down into Ohio. Um, and so if you are interested, I know Sienna put uh, a link uh, and Mike uh, Midvinsky put a link to our, our website with the, uh, the workshop. So if you're interested, um, our applications for next summer uh, should hopefully go up uh, right at the start of the fall. Uh, but there's more information on, on what the workshop is there. Great, and if you're watching the recorded version of this, just look right below. And you'll see those there. And then I want to, it's time for us to end, but I want to ask this question. I've been asking this a lot lately. What brings you joy when you think about the work that you're doing? What was just something about it that's joyful to you? I think uh, for me, I, I, get, I get the most joy out of students being proud of, of what they've accomplished. Um, and so one of the things that I like to have students do as we go into our final project is to take a look at your first unit project, and really see how far your thinking has come, really see how far your research has come and your writing. Um, and, and students really do leave the course feeling proud of all the hard work that they put in. And I think for me, I think that that probably brings the most joy. And, you know, in addition to the, to the average student, we have a lot of students who are entering and gaining recognition in state and national competitions. We have students who are now getting published by a local historical society. We have a student who uh, has been hired as a summer intern by a local historical society to do um, podcasts for them. And so really, you know, there's, there's a lot of pride in the work that they do in the school year, but then students want to do this type of work outside of school as well. Um, and so that for me brings, brings the most joy because, because they see the value in what we do, not just in class, but then they take it to, to outside of class as well. Mm -hmm. And also the- Do you the, want to add anything? Yeah, that just, I mean, to echo everything Chris said, but also the idea of just being in the trenches with the students, like learning alongside them and being equal partners in the process is really fulfilling uh, because they bring so much, you know, they, they have such good questions. They have such uh, good 
uh, analysis and, and ideas and, and their prior knowledge that they bring that we don't have. And we bring things that they don't have yet. Uh, and just this collaborative experience, really, uh, you, 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 the time flies by in class. The time flies by on the site visits. Um, it's, it's just magical. So I love it. I can only imagine that many of us here are thinking that's the class I'd like to take. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today to share this. Um, really look forward to continuing to follow your work and have you back again. Thank, thank you so for having much. us. Thanks for coming. Bye, so everyone. Much. Bye.